call the afternoon part of the meeting together. And we're going to um, – I understand some of the folks wanted to do public participation after our presentation, so we'll, we'll yield to that. But for other folks who showed up at our normal public participation time, which is 1 o'clock, we're going to allow that first. And then accommodate our presentation, and then those of you who wanted to use that uh, that time, you're welcome to do so then. So with that in mind, okay. Mercs, please. Um, thank you for coming for public participation. I'll just go over the ground rules. The board um, does not, by matter of their policy, engage in a discussion here at the board table. They're happy to hear what you've got to say. If you have handouts, you can pass them to the nearest person at the table, and they'll be happy to distribute them around. Today we have um, a stack of people who wish to address the board, so you will each get three minutes public participation. Um, if you want to come to the table with another member <coughs> of your group, you can. If that makes you feel more comfortable, you can also do that. So the first person I have is John Love. Mr. Love, if you'll come to the end of the table. He'll be followed by Rick Catherman. Kind of appropriate. I came because of this meeting. I'm just passing out a copy of the Constitution. You talked quite uh, well about the need to obey the Constitution, and you're quite right. It says all public education, not as the governor claims. Well, I can do whatever I want. I don't even see him here. He's a member of the Con member of this body. He's not present. You don't even put him in the minutes as being whether he's absent or present. So. He's not, he's not even doing his duty to be a <coughs> participant as a member of this committee, this board. And he's going to come up with this stuff. Let's look at his record. Four emergency managers for the Detroit school system. What does that tell you? When does the emergency start? They don't even know. It's just keep putting people in. If you have an army, you don't say, well, we'll send a new general in and that'll fix everything. You give them the support that's needed. And Wayne State University was part of the Detroit school system. They should be involved in this, deeply involved. The responsibility, uh, the people down there don't say, well, we don't want good education, so we'll just let them do whatever they want. The only body that has the ability that, and the responsibility is right here at this table. You have to say, we're going to do this. We're going to pick out the team that's going to fix it. That's your responsibility, period, not somebody else's. The governor's just trying to do something because he doesn't know what to do. So he's going to do that. The other thing I have to give you is uh, I was in the library. Uh, we're supposed to have local control. Well, here's the 2003 school law. And it says that they had examiners, they had people out there checking on the schools. This is what they did in 1905. So take a look at that to see what could be done. This deal with uh, Illich giving him school aid money to build an arena, that's a quarter billion dollars. That's what they're doing, a quarter billion dollars. And the Attorney General says, well, that's okay, because we have plenty of money. We don't need it for schools. Well, that's a big problem. So he, write the, he has the Attorney General, and what you need to do is send a letter to the Attorney General that, that you've put together here and ask him to enforce the Constitution. So he's always on duty to do that. Uh, here's the Constitution. Here's what he did. He conveniently omitted the text of the actual laws. The actual law says the taxes levied under this act shall be distributed as provided in this act, and it mentions the Constitution. That's where the school taxes are supposed to go, not for <coughs> Illich's hockey team. It's a joke. Then I took the trouble of uh, look. He said it's this is a local project with public funds. You know what that means? That means you have to have, according to the Constitution, I have it here, it has to take a two-thirds vote. Well, they only had 58, not the 74 they needed. But don't worry, we're going to spend that money anyway because the Constitution means nothing. We just do whatever we want. So there's a copy of that for everybody, too. And my time's up. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. <coughs> Excuse me.
Well, the next group's coming up. I might mention, if you see Warner, who was Secretary of State in 1903, he became governor, and then he retired to become president of the Michigan, uh, I'm sorry, of the Farmington School Board. So there is an ascension here, governor <laughs> and president of the school board. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Rick Katherman, and he will be followed by Holly Windrum. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. I've had an opportunity to meet several of you in different capacities um, over the last couple of years. Uh, Mr. Ziley um, at the Network of Mich uh, Michigan Educators Conference a few years ago and several others. Um, we were fortunate, the group I'm representing today, the Partnership for Music Education Policy Development, we held a Music Education Policy Summit last June on the campus of Michigan State University, and we were fortunate enough to have President Austin as well as Trustee um, Weiser to be in attendance and help us through. Um, communication with some of our goals and initiatives with the group that we're looking for. Today we are here in support of our colleagues from across the state. Just came from some terrific uh, music concerts at the Rotunda in the Capitol building, which is absolutely terrific. Some energy in the, in the Capitol from some young people providing some terrific music. Um, I wanted to thank Marilyn for her assistance in, in helping us to be here today and to, to present to you for just a moment. Um, I do hope maybe in the future to have an opportunity to come and present to you in a little broader spectrum um, in regards to some of the things that we're doing, our goals and our mission. Um, but what I can tell you is our goal is to provide or to assure that quality music education is being provided by certified um, educators qualified music educators and that our students are all uh, given the opportunity to participate and learn through music instruction. Um, I'm going to read here briefly, Partnership for Music Education Policy Development, um, as I mentioned, is here today in support of our colleagues. The impact of music education is far reaching. We believe in music as a core subject in our schools, as has been recognized by the national standards as well and value its contribution to the education of a child and its contribution to the quality of a person's life into adulthood. Today we bring special attention to issues impacting music in our schools, including pre-service and in-service teacher evaluation. I've had the opportunity to speak with um, several House representatives as they look to, unfortunately, the legislation that um, Representative Zimke and had put together with Representative O'Brien at the time, did not come to fruition at the end of the last session. Um, but we've been in conversation and, and uh, back and forth with those folks about how that impacts music teachers. We've been very fortunate how generous those folks have been with us. As well as uh, teacher evaluation, we are also looking at a K-5 general music mandate for the state of Michigan. We are one of five um, states that does not currently have a K-5 general music mandate. We had long discussion, thorough discussion at our summit about that, and with the input from um, Mrs. Weiser and, and, and President Austin, I think we've been able to, to kind of formulate some more ideas. We have issued and published two policy documents that we're sharing across the Capitol um, as well today. The mission of the partnership is to create a relationship with all education policy stakeholders in Michigan. We want to be a resource for you as well as our state lawmakers and the Michigan Department of Education and work to create policies that assure quality teachers, adequate resources, and a quality education that includes music for every child in the state of Michigan. Um, I do want to recognize two, of, uh, two other members of our organization today from Dexter Schools. This is Dr. Ken Moore, Director of Bands at uh, Dexter. Um, from Michigan State University, this is Professor Mitchell Robinson, um, music education professor at Michigan State University. I teach in the Chelsea School District. We were fortunate to have um, Trustee uh, Fecto and um, Mrs. Strauss come and visit our school a couple years ago, which was terrific. Um, I'm a music educator in the Chelsea School Districts and director of the high school bands. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Again, I hope I have the opportunity to come back in the future. Um, and I believe some of my colleagues from across the state may be providing some public input as well a little bit later in your meeting. So thank you very much. All the best as you continue your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my next understanding that this, these next three people are a group. If I'm wrong about that, please feel free to correct me. Um, Dr. Holly Windrum, Thomas Bobo, and Renee Borg. And uh, may we request that um, the minutes for Ms. Borg and Mr. Bobo be delegated? So you're going to be the spokesperson? Yes, okay. please. Thank you. Good afternoon. We are from 
the Hope Network's Michigan Education Corps program. We are an AmeriCorps program, and if you go into your folders, I'm going to be referencing a series of slides, and I'll go through those fairly quickly. Um, at the Hope Network, we help people overcome, and Michigan Education Corps helps kids overcome. And in this program, we start by reaching kids on a relational level first, and then reaching them at an academic level to develop in them the belief in themselves that they can overcome. And in this case, it would be reading and the need to read. AmeriCorps is a nonprofit. Uh, we are not a vendor. Uh, we do not contract. Um, we are about finding those people who have a passion for service in their communities and tapping into that and addressing whatever the key needs of communities are, in this case, literacy and ensuring proficiency at third grade. Our members uh, put in 1,700 hours of service in one year, and they provide one-to-one -one targeted research-based reading interventions for children age three to grade three. If you'll notice, um, we partner with AmeriCorps. The program that we implement is called Reading Corps. A randomized control trial study by the University of Chicago confirmed that the Reading Core program significantly accelerates literacy achievement for children age three to grade three, and I'll talk a little more about that. Reading Core was started in the state of Minnesota about 10 years ago. It started in four Head Start preschools <coughs> and was a partnership between a senator and then to be education commissioner, Alice Segrin, and a community, uh, excuse me, a, a curriculum director. And it grew substantially. If you look at the growth chart here, just last year in Minnesota, this program served over 35,000 students with over 1,100 AmeriCorps members. So they're statewide. And one of the uh, long-term outcomes that they've seen is a recognition of savings in special education cost savings, um, given that it costs less to intervene early, close the achievement gap, and they're recognizing that. The randomized control trial study uh, had two significant findings. One, it answered the question of, is this program replicable in other states? And the answer was yes, in diverse geographic regions and with members of diverse backgrounds. And in particular, is it effective for diverse learners? And the answer was yes, particularly those who had <coughs> higher risk factors for not reading proficiently at uh, grade three, <coughs> students who are dual language learners, students who are economically disadvantaged. So Minnesota has been asked by the National Corporation to expand, and Michigan was one of the states just about two years ago that stepped in and said, we want to be a part of this. Our mission is that all children will have the opportunity to read proficiently by third grade, and in a multi-tiered systems of support framework, we are a tier two intervention. Last year, excuse me, this year we're serving in 23 schools. We have been invited by the Flint Community Schools to be in all of their elementaries next year. The Skillman Foundation has reached out to us and they would like to write a multi-year grant for us to expand in the Detroit area as well through their five neighborhoods. We have a waiting list of schools. We have done no marketing. We have not reached out. This is all word of mouth. So we have schools that are excited about this and would like to participate. You can see some of our outcomes from last year, very positive high rates of growth for students who needed to grow and make more than a year's growth in a year. And our schools um, really appreciated having the program. It had a very positive impact. To date, uh, we have 40 tutors serving in our 23 schools. We've served just about 550 students and 77 of those students so far are showing a positive trajectory. And I'll show you an example of a student graph in a moment. You see the core of the program here. It's a foundation of database decision making, evidence-based practices and progress monitoring, and then rigorous attention to fidelity. And we wrap around our tutors and our members, excuse me, our tutors and children with two layers of coaching, one at the school level and one from an outside master coach in the program. The tutoring is one-on-one -on -one every day, five, or, uh, five days a week, 20 minutes, for an additional 100 minutes of reading instruction. It's targeted towards the child's specific reading needs. We progress monitor each child weekly. Last year, on average, our students were reading at grade level in 14 weeks. The key to fidelity of our program is our coaching model. Our master coaches not only support it throughout the whole school, but they also ensure attention to fidelity with our assessments so there are good data coming in to make decisions and that the interventions are done, being done with high quality. There is a family component as well called RA. 
So an example, uh, Darian is one of our students last year. He is in the Muskegon Heights School District and school-wide screening showed that when he entered second grade, he was reading below grade level. He entered the program and he needed to work on both accuracy and fluency. The slide that you see on the next page are Darian's data. The black line is Darian's goal line. The green dotted line are his fluency data. The blue dotted line is a mathematically calculated slope. And the red dotted line are his accuracy data. And we want that to be decreasing, meaning his error rates are decreasing. A team meets monthly. The two coaches, the tutor, and the classroom teacher when available to review each child's graph and make a determination if the instruction is working as desired. For Darian, you can see where database decision making happened in that middle thick red line. They drew an intervention they wanted to accelerate progress. Darian successfully exited the program after about 16 weeks, and in order to exit, a child has to have three to five data points at or above their goal line, and two of those data points must be at the child's grade level spring benchmark target. So it's a very high standard. Once a reading core child, always a reading core child, we will benchmark past and current kids through the end of third grade three times a year using our screening to catch them. I won't talk much about the next graph, but this is another child who was reading two grade levels below when she started in the program, and she did successfully end her school year reading at grade level, and that's the story of that next graph. The story of growth is really important for us because if you're reading below grade level, you can't just grow at the same rate as your same grade peers. You have to grow faster. And so that's the story of most of our students that participate in our program. Costs. We know that not reading at the third grade level proficiently sets the stage for some potential uh, higher costly outcomes to society. And if you look at this graph here, I won't go into detail, but this year we're running the program at the cost of $1,150 per child. Next year with expected growth, um, actually we're estimating about $1,000 per child. Minnesota, due to economy of scale, runs the program for about $800 per child now. If you would like to learn more, there's our website, and the randomized control trial study research is all available through Serve Minnesota. And I made I made it through faster than uh, than the timer. So we are so appreciative of this opportunity. Thank you uh, to Lupe for for inviting us and for the opportunity to speak with you all. And um, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. I have two more public participation forms. They're from Omar Cuevas and Roberto Torres. And it's my understanding you want to speak after the English language learner presentation. Does anyone else have any public participation forms? Okay. Okay. Well, great. Then we're going to go. Do we have to formally go back? We probably do. To go back to the committee of the hall. Mm -hmm. And so I hereby call that to order. It, the time is now 1.30. And we're going to get back to item C, which became item D. And it's what we've all been waiting for. So please, my colleagues, please join us at the table. I think it's Natasha, Vanessa, Mike, Shireen, and Maria. Some may be coming up and back based on their point of presentation. This is requested. I'm going to have a seat first. The board requested this presentation at agenda planning and it, on the supports for English language learners. The presentation provides an overview of the assessment requirements, the accountability measures, and the services provided to English learners. I'm not sure. I think it's Natasha. Okay. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Um, a few weeks ago, Lupe uh, mentioned English language learners, and so we uh, connected with the Office of Field Services, which oversees the Title III dollars, um, to uh, pr put together this presentation. Um, there's also a data component to uh, the work, and so we have Vanessa Kiesler here to support in that space. So I'm going to turn it over now to Mike Radke, who's the Director of Field Services. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Um, basically, we're going to do a little overview of uh, Title III, 
Title I and uh, the civil rights legislation related to English language learners. Talk about the purpose and objectives of, of the um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act related to English learners, some of the supports and services we do, and then the assessment and accountability components. By the way, Mike did an excellent job at the School Improvement Conference yesterday. I thought it was very succinct, and you made your points pretty clearly at that luncheon, so thank you. Thank you, Mike. It was great to be there. and It's always nice to recognize uh, schools that are doing great work out there. So um, if we go to the next slide, basically the um, um, Civil Rights Act of 1964 established that um, English learners uh, have the right to be educated in two ways in particular. First of all, they, uh, they need, in our public schools, they need to be uh, uh, educated to uh, be facile with the English language. So speaking, writing, listening um, are all uh, key components that uh, we have to be teaching uh, these students. But secondly, they also have to have access to the regular curriculum. That's math, science, social studies, and anything else that's defined in the local curriculum. They need to be learning in those subjects while they're acquiring English proficiency. Um, so all of the public schools have the responsibility to provide training in acquiring English and all the other content areas with the basic foundation that they get with state aid and state and local aid. Um, the, the other two programs in uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Title III and Title I, are complementary to each other. Title III, though, kind of establishes uh, high standards for proficiency in English. Um, it uh, establishes the need for research-based strategies to help students acquire Eng English. Um, it provides for a, a significant amount of uh, professional development for teachers of English learners uh, so that they use appropriate strategies that are research-based. Um, there's a parent engagement component to the Title III program. Um, parents of English learners are also um, needing to um, uh, engage with the school and in sometimes that's in their own native language. Um, and then finally there's a immigrant uh, component to uh, the Title III program. Uh, we need to help them uh, transition into the U.S. and Michigan societies. Title I is the, is the a component of ESEA that uh, requires assessment and accountability. So when a student um, comes to the United States or uh, comes to uh, schools, uh, primarily speaking uh, their own native language, uh, we are required, our schools are required to, to screen their English skills. So find out what level of um, uh, ability do they have in uh, speaking the language so that we know how to help them. And then annually thereafter, they get an uh, uh, annual assessment of, of their um, English skills and then also their content skills. So are they making progress in math, science, social studies, um, and, as well as English? Okay. And that kind of sets the context for our, um, our presentation today. Maria Silva is going to talk to you a little bit about the population here in the state of Michigan. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone. Um, if you look at the uh, next slide, it talks about the population of our English learners in Michigan and how it's growing. So if you study the numbers, you can tell that since 2010 till last year, we've had significant increases in the population. Uh, also, the, um, the next, that's the red graph, the blue graph talks about or will illustrate the number of districts or the numbers of children who are being provided funding through Title III. That doesn't mean that districts aren't servicing them. They're still being identified and they're being serviced, but these are districts and, and pretty much most districts will apply <coughs> for Title III funding to support what they're doing in the districts already with the <coughs> basic funds. And then Title III comes in to provide supplemental services over and above what they're providing through their chosen um, language programs. Uh, 
the bottom line will illustrate the number of immigrant children who have come into the state and have been identified and are being serviced through Title III immigrant programs. What um, is probably significant about all of this is that the funding has been stable from 2010 till now. It's been about $9 million for the state. Last year with the numbers of children identified, it's about $95 per child over and above you know, that districts can use to supplement programs and those programs that Mike talked about a little bit and then what Shereen will follow up with. Um, the, and all, also important um, feature to note is again our immigrant population, look that it has doubled uh, and we tend to think that we've uh, worked collaboratively stronger with the Office of Assessment and CEPI to ensure that districts are properly identifying students, they're assessing them, and then that the Office of Field Services does uh, and has worked diligently to support districts in providing technical support so that the ongoing support systems that are going on um, are being fulfilled and that the legislation is, is being fulfilled as well as then our follow-up technical support that we do through field services. The next slide will tell you and what mostly um, you, we get asked are what are the common, most commonly spoken languages in Michigan. Uh, not surprisingly, Spanish is um, the blue bars uh, that illustrates uh, Spanish language or, or homes where Spanish is identified as the um, first language in the home. And then uh, the next bar is Arabic, third is Bengali, Albanian, fourth one, and then uh, our Chinese and Vietnamese population which have similar numbers. There are uh, dozens and dozens of languages being spoken in the state. The numbers become less significant and so that these are the most popular languages in, in the state. So um, given that, then I'm going to, uh, Shereen will uh, follow up with what those important pieces are that um, talk about our support and what we do. Good afternoon. So what kind of support does MDE provide to English learners across the state of Michigan? Um, ESEA requires local educational agencies to submit a plan with the funds, basically describing uh, how exactly will they support English learners in achieving proficiency in English as well as reading, math, science, and social studies. When they submit the plan, uh, in order to be flexible and, and you know, uh, make sure that the plan is within the district improvement plan, we said to the districts, please submit it with the di district improvement plan, not separately. This way there's no duplication of effort and there is better coordination with the other state and federal funds. So this is from the onset, we're expecting the districts to coordinate all services and funds for English learners, especially the funds that they have eligibility for. When they submit the plan, their plan has specific measurable objectives that align with the federal requirements. They're called the annual measurable achievement objective. Vanessa mentioned AMAOs earlier today. The ELs have also AMAOs, which basically focus on percent of students who are annually making progress in English, percent of students who are annually prof are proficient in English, and percent of students who are also proficient in reading and mathematics. These are three MAOs that the districts are held accountable for, and we support them toward achieving. The plan that they submit to us also includes instructional strategies, like Mike said, that are research-based. They have to be proven uh, strategies and approaches that are effective with English learners. They also have ways of how the districts will hire highly qualified teachers and train teachers to ensure that every teacher and every administrator who works with English learners has a skill set and the competencies to ensure this program is successful, the, the teachers are delivering instruction in a comprehensible way to students. It also requires family outreach and family literacy. So a lot of the immigrant funds can be focused on transition to U.S. society, transition to U.S. schools, and also family literacy to new immigrants who have been in the country for less than three years. When we receive the plan, our team reviews the plan and expects coordination with the rest of the state and federal funds 
and, and monitors the districts to ensure that the plan is implemented with fidelity and is evaluated annually. If the district does not meet the, the objectives that are in the plan, then MDE provides the support and the, know -how, and the how to improve that plan. Technical assistance, face-to-face, -face, webinars. We do several sessions with those districts to ensure that their plan is impro improved so those students can achieve those targets, proficiency targets. Now, since we have only 88, we have 88,000 ELs, but we have only 9 million with $95 per student, we are very limited as to how we can provide statewide training to teachers and administrators. <coughs> and so we were creative in partnering with the Great Lakes Comprehensive Center, <coughs> and who also partnered with the, with the, uh, the uh, Center for Applied Linguistics. And through that partnership, we provide a training of trainers to at least 30 coaches every year. Uh, those coaches learn how to uh, provide instructions, that strategies that work. They turn around and they train other teachers and administrators within their district, within their region, with our support. And currently, we've been doing this for over five years. We have over 100 trainers. Those trainers connect with us. They come back to meet together to share experiences, successes, strategies, challenges. We support them. And it's, it's a great way for us to build capacity within the districts and the ISDs to support English learners and the system, the system change. Uh, the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit. I, I wanted to share something else that is very, um, before that, uh, I could. Um, and you asked, well, okay, so how many participants have you had in 2013, 14? Just to let, give you an idea how uh, we were successful in partnering with several organizations and ISDs and even universities to implement those trainings. We had about 15,000 participants in 2013-14. Participants in training. This includes administrators, teachers, coaches, interventionists, classroom teachers, parents, community. And these data results we gather from the districts annually because we're supposed to submit such report to the federal government annually. So um, having talked about the support system we have in place, what has been the impact? Is it making a difference? Um, I am very pleased to say that we have some good news to share with you. Uh, number one is that English learners have demonstrated uh, steady progress, slow but steady progress in reading and mathematics despite language limitations. Let's remember they're limited English proficient. They are not proficient yet. Uh, however, they are required to take the state assessment, reading, math, science, social studies. So with that limitation, they're still making progress. When we look at students who exited the programs because of proficiency in English, and that is a true measure of the impact of the program, we see those students making significant improvement in their achievement in reading and mathematics. And those achievement results are really comparable to their general education peers. So, so this is, again, a piece of good news. The other piece I want to share is that um, a key of key factor in moving students forward is quality, effective teachers. We all know that. And um, effective teachers for English learners are required to have an endorsement, meaning special preparation over and above their certification that focuses on second language acquisition theory and practice strategies. And we have noticed that the, the last three years, our endorsed teachers who work directly with English learners has increased by 58% from 457 to 721. And if I look at ratio 88,000 to 72 one students, 721 students, I still have a ratio of one teacher to 122 students. So it's still not there, but we're making progress in that with that regards. And then the, the last piece I'd like to share with, with great news regarding impact we were audited by U.S. Ed in May 2013, and the U.S. Ed team 
uh, provided a lot of uh, positive feedback to us on the effective uh, support system we have, procedures, common procedures, improving data collection and support and assessment, uh, and they had no findings, so that's great. However, we as a team know that there is uh, still uh, a lot of room for uh, improvement, and with the EL advisory that we have, we just developed a strategic plan for the next three years that will continue to provide us the roadmap for continuous improvement um, across the program. So I'm at the table to talk about assessment and accountability. Uh, I think Mike referenced at the beginning that this is a multi-office uh, enterprise uh, working with our English language learners across the state. So I'm actually here representing Office of Standards and Assessments, Office of Systems Improvement, Office of Educational uh, edu Evaluation, Strategic Research and Accountability, and CEPI. So I drew the straw. But Jen Paul is our English language uh, assessment consultant in the back and is here. And you can see we're already a little crowded down here. So um, just wanted to say Jen Paul, Ji Zhang, Chad Bailey, Chris Janzer all work Jen, on this on extensively as well. Who would you like to join us? Um, so what are we required to do around assessment and accountability? And uh, we thought Lupe's question was really about support, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. But there are a lot of questions around assessment and accountability for these students. So what are we required to do? Kind of shorthand, we are required to have these high quality standards for English language um, acquisition. So this is outside of our ELA standards, content standards for all students. We have to have um, standards for English language proficiency acquisition. And then we need to have assessments that measure both English language proficiency and our content standards. So there's two kind of testing structures that uh, ELLs participate in or English, English learners participate in. Um, we have to hold schools and districts accountable on the performance of their EL students as a subgroup, and that's what Mike was referring to. And then we also have to hold districts accountable for their English language proficiency levels of their English learners and the progress of their students toward proficiency. That's the AMAOs that Shireen referenced earlier. Next one. A um, little bit of history, and Jen, feel free to jump in if you'd like. Um, English Learner Assessment Accountability. In the fall of 2012, you, this body, <laughs> approved our, uh, the WIDA English Language Development Standards. So these are, again, those standards about the acquisition of the English language, uh, separate from our content standards in ELA. And then in the fall of 2013, our schools began using the uh, corresponding assessments with these, which measure students in listening, reading, writing, and speaking skills. And so we have, the, that's called the WIDA. Um, we have the, the list of them up there. There's the screener, the placement test, and then the WIDA access for ELLs, which is our summative annual assessment. And then we have WIDA alternate access for ELLs, so that's the test for ELs who are also students with disabilities. So pretty comprehensive suite of assessment resources for this population. Um, and here is just a bit of results from our 2014 WIDA, um, WIDA access administration. So you can kind of see there's six levels from entering to reaching, <laughs> and they're down across the bottom, and then you can see our grade spans going up. And you again, can this see is- we, we love colors. We, we find do. We love right. colors. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, there's a lot of purple involved in this one, too. Can you go back one slide, please? Just to note here, um, you can see as you look across the grade bands that at kindergarten, there's a lot more students in entering and emerging, and then as you move up the grade bands, there's um, more students moving up through developing, expanding, bridging, which is what we would expect, you know, as students are in the system for longer, um, as they acquire more English language, we would hope to see them moving up. And then um, at some point, the population overall gets smaller because students begin to exit from English language learner status into formerly English language learner status. And now I go to the next slide. Um, this talks a little bit about kind of the, uh, the AMAOs, the historic, uh, the accountability system that we have in place. So again, there's three types of AMAO. Well, there's really five. The, th the three we talk about primarily, um, one is progress. So that is, again, our districts are enough ELL students progressing toward achieving their English language proficiency. The second is proficiency, so how many are achieving it. And then the third, we flip over to their Title I accountability, and we look at how ELL students are doing um, in math and reading in the content areas. And then they have to participate, and we brought that online, and then overall, how the district is doing overall. So you can see across the top how we've been um, doing over the past few years. Um, you'll notice that fewer districts are meeting the progress AMO over time, so that's the top, so 83% in 2010 11, up to 51% in 2012 13. Partly that's because the, the 
the, the standards increase. So not only do more students have to, um, not only do students have to be progressing, but more of them have to progress over time. Um, it's also the WIDA, the switch to WIDA assessment and the incoming, I mean, it's hard to say all causes, but one is the growing population of students too. And so there's a lot, this is one of our measurements though to kind of understand how we're, how students are doing in acquiring the English language. Um, AMAO2, which is the number of students who are proficient, you can see those numbers as well. And then the scorecard, uh, and then participation. Like I said, we've begun to bring the participation requirement online over time. Um, so who has to be in this? And again, this is derived from Title III law primarily, uh, as well as some Title I overlap. But any student who is determined to be an English learner is required to take an assessment of English language proficiency each year. So that would be our WIDA. So they all have to take the WIDA each year. Every student who is an English learner has to take the WIDA. That's part of that participation requirement we're talking about AMAOs. Did you take the WIDA? Um, they are also required to take the content assess assessments. So this year that would be MSTEP or My Access and have those scores included in school and district accountability under Title I. Uh, US Ed does allow and we do utilize a one-year exception for students who've been in the country for less than one year. Um, so this is an exception specifically for test participation in English language arts. So if you're still, if, you're only, if you've been for less than a year, you don't have to take the ELA assessment. Um, well, you don't, you, have to, you don't have to have those scores included. Um, they still have to take the other subjects, but scores can be excluded from the Title I accountability determinations. Uh, we have in the past, this was a question that came up, we have requested from US Ed several times in my time here, flexibility in more years. Can we have more years before the students have to take ELA or other subjects? Can we also extend the exception to other subjects because of the heavy literacy load? Uh, as of yet, US Ed has not granted that sort of flexibility, but we continue to ask when there are chances for um, representing the fact that taking the content test when you're still acquiring the language is a challenge for these students. Um, they're only included in the Title I accountability if they're full academic year, if they've been here the whole year. So for some of our students who are more migrant students, some of them wouldn't be included because they're not here the whole year. Um, and then all of them have to be included in the Title III, the AMAOs. So I think we're just at questions, right? This is our last slide. Yeah. So that was a lot of information, especially at the very end. But like I said, I, uh, we believe that the, co the conversation when Lupe asked, it was more about overall, what are we doing to provide? So um, speaking as the assessment accountability person, that often dominates the discussion. But we don't, we don't believe that what we do is assess and hold accountable only. We believe we also support and that that's really why we're engaged in this work. But we also know people have a lot of questions about how these students are included in the assessments and accountability and then what we're doing to reach them. So look forward, Mike, we'll turn it back to you for questions. You know, I just before I ask board for their comments and questions, I, I mean, you know, I was superintendent in Farmington, Farmington Hills over 20 <laughs> years ago, and I just marveled at the young people coming in that, in that era from Iraq and other places. And I, I can't even imagine putting myself in the same spot where I go to um, Egypt or, or Mexico, and I'm expected to almost right away succeed. It's amazing what you do. And I would just say to our, our team, you don't often see uh, uh, Shireen, Maria, or Jen, but these are real professionals. And, and they also care about the special populations that we work with, which is also true in each of our school districts. So this is a big, a big lift, but it's, uh, it's America. You know, it's what makes us great. So. I uh, appreciate your asking. I don't know if you wanted to start. Uh, oh, yes, I, I do. Well, first of all, thank you very, very much for, for the information that you have provided. I started my career in, in bilingual ed. It was called bilingual ed at the time. Okay, it, and the teachers have a lot of questions, and I have a lot of questions, and you answered some of them. Now, one of the great questions that, that the teachers have, and you touched the first year students, you, did you say that they have to be tested, but the, the score does not count in Title I, but it has to be counted in another, in another right. department? So I went through, that, that was, it's a little bit tricky and the team can override me if I get anything wrong. Um, they can be exempted from taking the ELA content test entirely, so they don't have to sit for the assessment at all, correct? Mm -hmm. So they just don't have to take the ELA M step, for instance, this year when in their first year in, the, uh, first year in the country. They do have to sit for the other relevant content assessments, so math, 
science if it's that year, social studies if it's that year. We have asked US Ed multiple times, can we please extend that one year exemption at least to other subjects because there's a substantial reading load in other subjects and we have, no, that is not allowable under Title III law. Well, and then, could I go just, ahead, go sorry, ahead. I just want, so that's, um, those don't, so in that first year they don't have to be included in accountability per se, but they do have to sit for the test, which we understand is problematic if a student really can't speak English yet, this is not great. Um, there are accommodations in our test to deliver the assessments in other languages, um, Spanish and, and Arabic primarily, but again, we would still like some flexibility there that we haven't been able to get from US Ed. They all have to take the WIDA, the English Language Proficiency Assessment, um, the, the test of how much English they are learning, <coughs> regardless of how long they've been here or not been here. So, and then that rolls up into the Title III accountability, the AMAOs, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. The, the, yeah. the problem or the concern of the teacher that asked me that particular question was that these students have not even been in school before. So they were frustrated that they have to be sitting in a test when they don't know a pencil, they don't know a paper, they don't know desk, they don't know, they don't know anything about a school setting, but they had to sit through the test and it was very frustrating for the student and for the teacher. And so that they was, you have to help us, Lupe, because these students are very frustrated, and we're very frustrated, and we're not getting anywhere. We're not getting support from the district, and I have to do something with these students. And it's not just one or two; they're coming right. in in big pockets of, right. of immigrants. Okay. Uh, so, so that was a very very uh, high concern. Now the other one is the the, the teachers are telling me. We, the district has to, administration has to come and revisit what it says in that report that you talked about, the, uh, the, the proposal that they sent to you, and this is what you're going to do, and then this is how you assess their, their performance in the school district. They're saying, we want our, the district, the administration, to revisit what they proposed they were going to do, and how is the department checking to see if, in essence, they are doing what they said they were going to do? Because we're not seeing this, we're not seeing this, we're not seeing that. And so that's very frustrating at this point for a lot of the teachers because they feel that they, the district said they were going to do these things and they're not doing them. So uh, how is the department doing that and holding the districts accountable for what they said they were going to do? to reach the, the success of these students. So that's another big concern. Uh, so, so you don't have to answer that. Maybe you can tell unless the, the public wants yeah. to know those kind of things. But that, that is a, a very real question as to how, you know, what do you do to hold them accountable? Uh, and do you go and check to see with the teachers in the classrooms? Uh, what in essence is really happening, or do you just take it for granted that what you're giving as feedback is in reality happening? Okay, so uh, what we do, we, pro we actually conduct monitoring visits annually to districts and we visit schools. Uh, excuse me, do you do them randomly or, okay. or they're programmed? Good question. We do it actually based on risk factors including complaints. I have to tell you, in confidence, teachers do call us. And they may say, I'm Shireen, but I won't tell you anything more than my name, my first name. <laughs> and they'll say, I know you have uh, you know, approved a plan and funding for my district, but like your scenario, we have several students in my classroom and I don't get the support we need for my students. So what we do, we basically, in confidence, do conduct monitoring visits, even we, if we did not plan it, to ensure that those students are receiving the support services. So our monitoring visits are planned based on achievement data, basically, whether they met the AMOs or not, and also complaints. We get complaint, we take it very seriously. And I have to tell you, and that's what makes me going with my team, we have been very effective in tuning in to people because they know they can trust us. And we go in without saying anything, it's just, just we, you know, we 
we selected you and we need to review you. And the impact of our visit has resulted in improvement for those students. So we just need to hear it. Um, it's hard to tell if we don't know those little stories that are very important, like the one you shared. We do look at the data. So if they're not meeting their objectives in the plan, we do visit. If their achievement data is dropping, we do visit. And if there are some concerns, we also visit. Jen, did you want to say something too? Yeah, I just wanted to address the first part of your question, which had to do with the lack of formal educational experiences when it comes time for the actual assessments and the negative impact that that can have at, at the time of the assessments. We actually have a number of supports in place, particularly this year with the switch to the new assessments and our new accessibility framework that would offer a lot of support to these students to help with orienting them at the time of the test. So across most of the assessments, the items can actually be translated, directions can be translated into whatever the language, whatever language the student needs. The students, if they don't, let's say to your example, they don't necessarily know how to hold a pencil yet, scribes are an available and allowable accommodation. So they could just tell whoever's doing the test administering at that time that what their response is, they can point to it. The test administrator could actually bubble it in for them if they're a paper pencil test taker. Um, so I, I would encourage you if you know of these districts that are struggling, particularly with those types of things at the time of the assessments, to have them contact our office so that I can help walk them through what options they do have for those students. And, so we well, have, and we, another thing, you know, the classes are large. So, you know, monitoring one by one, you know, that's not even. You know, in, in addition to what Jen said, I'm wondering, um, maybe I shouldn't wonder out loud about this. Maybe I'm regressing to my hippie days here, but what if we don't? I mean, what if we felt it really wasn't the child was just here two weeks ago, was in a tent two weeks ago and some far off country and now is ready to take a test. What's the penalty for not, not putting the, the person through that? Again, it's, um, so I, I appreciate Jen uh, providing the information on what we do to make it more accessible because we are under Title III federal law and under Title I law there's no, this isn't a flexibility area. So it gets us into the realm of what would U.S. Ed do if we didn't do those things. Um, U.S. Ed in two ways, right? U.S. Ed under Title III, U.S. Ed under Title I. I. I think that's always an area of question for everybody is what would happen. Um, in the interim, we've been following the law, you know, keeping at, uh, ostensibly our Title III money would come into question, our, you know. But I don't want to, I think we have, I have too many times sat at a table saying, well, we do it because U.S. Ed says when people say what would happen if we didn't, it's like, yeah. we haven't mm -hmm. not, so I don't know and I don't want to guess what I mean, U.S. Ed would we do. Would we know, not that I'm promoting this, but would we know if an individual district <laughs> chose to do what they thought was more humane two weeks later? Yes. yes. I mean, we know who participates and who doesn't. We have excellent data systems here in the state. Okay. Well, could, could we, you? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michelle. Could we not? Know? <laughs> you know, there's this opt-out movement. <clears throat> A lot of parents are um, choosing, and I'm feeling like I might do this um, at some point. But, um, so, is there a distinction if the parent opts out or if the school? I mean, what is the or, or if the school administration or teachers or whatever? Out. Again, um, in in both in all types of participation requirements, state and federal law require that all students participate in, it, in assessments. In practice, we look at 95%, allowing for cases where unforeseen things happen. There, in that 5% or in participation, there's no difference between a parent refusal or a district refusal or anything like. Kids are expected to participate. All all <coughs> kids are expected to participate. We have that 5% flexibility. So. Um, there isn't a, it would just count against their participation rate, essentially. And, but then if it goes below 95%, it's not viable or valid? Um, or? The, well, there's account, accountability consequences, and they differ by program. And for example, this morning, you saw in our thinking about how to release schools from priority status, one of the measures would be that they'd have to right. exceed 95% in their testing and participation. And if their parents choose to opt out? In general, so I want to talk about in general and then talk again about English learners because I think the department certainly agrees with the concerns echoed here. We echo your concerns about testing students who are new to the country, new to formal education. We are not, we do not want to defend this requirement per se. This is a requirement that we don't have, we have asked for flexibility every time they ask. We waive 
flags and beat drums and do whatever we can to say this needs to change and USAID has not provided us with flexibility. So I don't want to be in that range. In general, a, partici a, partici bleh, a participation requirement is necessary or else you don't know that those scores actually reflect what kids are learning. And you get into the challenge of potential gaming. Oh, we're only going to assess our 25 highest learning students and leave everybody else at home. And then that calls into question our ability to know how schools are doing. So that's in general participation. But we share the board's concerns with heavy participation requirements on newly arrived lack of formal education students and are continuing to seek flexibility with USA. Do we have any idea why the feds don't see that as a as a logical move to we have history in Title III law. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think it's exactly the conundrum that uh, Vanessa just pointed out. If you allow exceptions then you allow gaming. Okay? And so let's call ninety five percent good enough and you know, in general, I think over the course of the last 10 years since, maybe 12 years since NCLB came into effect requiring the participation in tests, what we've seen is schools can do this work. They can get 95% hey tested. May I, for my question, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I didn't mean the 95%. I meant going more than a year on a newly arrived student. If it, if it sounds so logical to us, I'm just trying to understand why it wouldn't seem. I think so. it's in the hands of legislators, and I think the community can go to legislators and ask for it. I think it, ha it was proposed in the past uh, with the reauthorization of ESEA. It was on the, on the, on the draft for three years. On the years. current draft? Uh, I think the past draft. That this, yeah. We should probably alert our folks. Yeah, to, because uh, the... Um, <coughs> the people who proposed three years really said, well, the research says you need five to seven years to acquire a language at the proficiency level that, you know, leads you to succeed on state assessments such as the ones in the states. So why are you just waiving it for one year? Well, maybe that, I would just... Sorry to add in the interest of time, and I'm just going to alert our legislative folks who must be working on legislation somewhere. I don't see them, but that we can try to make sure that's in our probably is already as they're scouting out what to try to do in Rio. That would be great. Yes, sir. Well, I would think that <coughs> testing all the students would would make sense because many immigrants come to this country with a background in English or they've learned some English uh, on, or I should think that that information would be valuable and it's not used to harm the, the, the student it's used to hold the school accountable and then you the sooner you start building a record the, the better it is for the student so uh, I could I mean it's yeah but we're not talking about students that have had <laughs> schooling we're talking about the students that have not had any schooling at all and they're teenagers already see what I'm saying yeah, I was in a classroom in Kentwood mm. and I was shocked mm. I don't know why I had an impression of that suburb that there were kids, and I'm not exaggerating, who were intense as refugees a week earlier had never had. So, I mean, to your point, I, you're making a point I would agree with. I well, do I, think there can, be an, but yeah. there can be an accommodation to school. Lupe's point when someone literally has never had and is probably in some level of trauma almost at that exactly. point, um, <laughs> what I was observing. On the other hand, uh, the Palestinians who raised in, in refugee camps have a higher educational attainment than uh, other Arabs uh, from their, their native countries. So I, I think this data is important to have and it helps you understand what portion of your immigrant community needs your very basic and which others are able to transition to a higher level. The points to be made on both sides of this. I think Dr. Ziley did a good job of probably capturing some of the thinking behind the original law about yes, ensuring yeah. that students in this country acquire English language and that they're not lost in the system, not learning English, not receiving services, and that schools and districts are held accountable. I think you're raising the flip side as we've implemented. There's some places where the one-size-fits-all approach is, is perhaps a struggle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank okay. you. Well said. So then you said that the limit is three years, and then they go into a regular classroom. Um, no, immigrant students are considered students who come to the country and are in the U.S. schools for less than three years are considered immigrant under Title III. Okay. Uh, and those receive, they are entitled to the immigrant funds, support, small group instruction, support for the families, transition, 
counseling, all kinds of supports. They are entitled to that. But they still have to take the assessment mm -hmm. um, after you know one year has passed. Okay, so, so you said something about the $95, but that's not all they get. That's an additional, there's a lot of other funding that they get, yes. and right? What I, yeah, and what I said when, we, when I talked about the plan is because the district submits the plan in one location with the whole consolidated application where they seek funding from Title I and Title mm -hmm. II and Title III and so on, we ensure that they coordinate efforts across all federal funding mm -hmm. because these students are also entitled and eligible for those funds as well. Right. So we really work very hard on making sure districts are coordinating the funds for those kids and not just the $95. Right. Maria just pointed one thing out that just to put on the table that um, not all <coughs> immigrants are limited English proficient or are English learners and not all English learners are immigrants. So there's mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. Some of the kids, kids right. probably yeah. wouldn't qualify so, for them. Yeah, right. So, I, I do want to put a footnote to Shireen's comment, though, $95 per student uh, for additional supplementary to help the, the school, help the student acquire English is not enough, mm -hmm. okay? It's been stable for 10 years now, um, and we have a growing population, so um, we have to do more to help the schools stretch those dollars coordinate those dollars with all the other sources of funding and do the best with what we've got. So the 95 are state or federal? That's federal. Federal, federal. okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lupe, thank you. for requesting this. And thank you for being excellent work. Appreciate your efforts with our kids. John, we're gonna, you know, I guess apparently they're doing a state superintendent search, I've heard, so <laughs> this is your turn. This has uh, been a very public process. Oh, you know oh, what? Yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize. Yes, we're, we're out of order. Be well, we're actually in order, <laughs> but we agreed to then go back to public participation go for ahead. those who wanted to hear the presentation first. So with that in mind, coming to the table. Omar Cuervas. 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 Thank you for helping me. Roberto. Oh, he's okay. Roberto is going first. Done. Thank you. Uh, based on the presentation, I wanted to go ahead and offer some commentary. That's totally well. fine with us. Thank you. They're friends. <laughs> yeah, I can tell that. <laughs> so we're ready when you're ready. Okay. Well, uh, uh, everyone, I want to introduce to you uh, Roberto Torres. He is our new director of the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan, housed in the beautiful city of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he has been in uh, office for two months, yes. or not even. About a month. And he's done more things than some people have done in 10 years. So I want to introduce to you uh, Roberto Torres. Good, good afternoon, all. I, I appreciate that comment. Don't let this count into my five minutes. Uh, but I appreciate that <laughs> comment uh, only because uh, I was in uh, one of the first meetings that I was asked to, to be at was a five hour long meeting. And when I arrived at Grand Rapids and I said to them, uh, five hours, I said, you realize I'm a Marine. And I said, Marines start and end the conflict in five hours. I said, you think we can plan for five minutes and then work the plan the rest of the time? Um, name is uh, Roberto Torres. And uh, just as a little background, I've uh, served in five different mayoral administrations in, uh, in Toledo, Ohio, in Canton, Ohio. I'm a native of, of Ohio. Don't hold that against me. Uh, in, in the five administrations that I've worked in, I've been Director of Youth Commission, Office of Latino Affairs, Department of Neighborhoods, Economic Development, and Board of Community Relations. Uh, when I was in the city of Canton, Ohio, I did Economic and Community Development. And in, in that time, I've also worked with schools, uh, so nine years in Catholic administration, working for the Diocese of Toledo. And then I also uh, ran for office and served as a board, uh, as a board member of the Toledo Public Schools. Uh, as if that wasn't enough, I uh, then... Uh, uh, started a uh, bilingual, bicultural uh, charter school specifically targeting uh, Latino children and Latino families uh, in Toledo. So I have that background as I come here. If we expect a child to be a loser, they will be a loser. If we expect them to be winners, they will be winners. Children rise and fall to the level of our expectation and those levels that are set primarily by their parents and educators. That was a quote uh, from Jaime Escalante. I had the opportunity to meet Jaime uh, many years ago when he came to the University of Toledo. 
He said that at a time when there was great contention about reaching out to Latino students in East Los Angeles. And at the time, uh, it was determined that these children could not achieve academically at a certain level, primarily in AP calculus. And he defeated those odds. And so as I hear the discussion today, it reminds me of what the discussion must have been back then. And I'll offer some suggestions on that. But when I arrived in, uh, when I arrived in Grand Rapids, um, I came because it was a very progressive community. It was listed by Forbes as the, most, uh, the number one city to actually raise a family. Um, it was a, a community that had a very rich philanthropic community that supported many, uh, um, uh, many projects in the community. And it was also one that was very prosperous economically. However, I also found out that I was coming into a community where even though the Latino population is the greater population in the school district, uh, it also has uh, a dropout rate of more than 50 percent. And so as we're looking at, uh, and I heard a comment that this is a growing community. You're right. Latinos is a growing population and continues to grow. And when we look at counties or we look at regions like Western Michigan, it's beginning to be the, the majority minority population uh, in the state. And yet we're looking at stats that don't look favorable on our educational process. So I go into this community and the one thing I look at is what are the treasures, what are the jewels? One of them is a program within the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan. It's called SOL. And I'm going to pass around some information. I apologize uh, that I don't have enough, but Lupe, if you could just pass one over to your colleagues. Um, this program is uh, supporting our leaders. It's a program for, uh, for high school students. And, and, and in the time that uh, this program has been established, we've had more than uh, 300 uh, students, uh, 800 students, that have actually graduated from the program. Now, earlier I mentioned the dropout rate is greater than 50%. The graduation rate of the students that are in our program, in the SOL program, is 89%. In fact, at the beginning of this year, the school year, we're, we're averaging about 93%. So we're going to actually increase that graduation rate. And as we look at programs like that, refer back to the comment or the quote that Jaime Esclante made. And that is that the primary educators or the primary influence in a child's life is either their teacher or their parents, i.e. the community. And so when we talk about education, don't dismiss the fact that as you have a lack of, of educators. Now, I heard, I heard bilingual. I didn't hear bicultural. There's, there's a big difference when you talk about speaking to somebody in a language and then being able to understand the culture that they're raised in or the culture that they bring into the school environment. Mm -hmm. And so in, in, in our program, what you get is bilingual and bicultural. When I said earlier I helped to start a school in Toledo, it was bilingual, bicultural. It is so the parents could be understood by the educators. So if you don't have bilingual, bicultural educators within the school system, and financially you're challenged to provide that, then why not reach out across the board to those community centers that are actually doing that work at a fraction of the cost? When you have a graduation rate of 89%, why are you not doing that? Why are you not reaching out to help support those, uh, the, those, those programs? I'm going to close with this. There's a saying that we have, and, and, I'm, a, and, and I'm a student, actually, uh, a product of Michigan schools. So during my middle school, I actually went to school at Walter French Junior High School. For those of you that may be too young, that's a new school now, um, but it uh, sat on, on Cedar and Hope uh, Avenue. So I went there, and just to reference, I went there when uh, Sam Vincent was actually a classmate of mine. And I, I tell people that, you know, I'm the only one that could actually claim that I guard Sam Vincent and held him down to uh, less than 10 <laughs> points. But that was junior high. I don't mention that. <laughs> so I'll leave you with this quote. Growing up in the migrant uh, fields, and that's what I did, I harvested crops. Growing up in the migrant fields, we used to have these troops that would go around and tell a story. They're called teatros, teatros campesino. And there's a quote by the teatro campesino that goes like this. Una gota, an ser poca, con otra se hace aguacero. One drop by as little. One drop by itself is just a little, but with another becomes a downpour. So I ask you today, I'm just introducing myself, Roberto Torres, director of the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan. But I'm asking you today, let's create a downpour, a downpour of concern, a downpour of real solutions for the Latino children of our state. There are programs across the street, just like, uh, just like uh, our program in, in Grand Rapids, that are, that are having amazing results. The information I pass to you is the program sold that got recognized by a national organization, Excelencia, <clears throat> Celebrando Excelencia, Celebrating Excellence. And out of all the models throughout the country, 
we were selected as the number one program of community-based program throughout the country for this award. It's here in our own back ground, our own back state. When I referenced it and Googled it, I couldn't find one news about it. When I looked at it locally, I couldn't find one press that covered it. Yet, I can tell you that we find out who's got the latest crime statistics on Latinos in our city. And I can tell you all the negative things that are happening. But when we have something like this, we need to celebrate it. I share that with you so that we can do something at the state to be able to celebrate these type of programs, if not even duplicate it or model it in other communities. Roberto Torres, director of the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan. Muchísimas gracias, and I appreciate the bienvenida que me han dado. Gracias. Thank you. Our next speaker is Omar Cuevas, and it's my understanding that he's coming to the table with Omar Jr., Adrian, um, Annie, Ashley, Samantha, and Emily. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and I'm going to need to reset this on three minutes and get another cheer. I think you. Well, you can have this. <laughs> no, I think we're still short of chair, so we'll just pull oh. one up. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> You look better with the daughter standing behind you. <laughs> <laughs> you all look great, by the way, and thanks for coming. Thank you, we thank you so much. Seeing. Thank you for the, for the welcome. We've had an awesome experience. Just put it down. Well, my name is Omar Cuevas, and uh, I brought with me, along with my girlfriend, our, our Brady Bunch, <laughs> and uh, six teenagers. Um, I'm a proud parent of, uh, of six Grand Rapids Public School students. And I have to say, um, my roots at Grand Rapids Public Schools will go way back. A product of uh, Crescent High School, so go Polar Bears. Um, <laughs> schools uh, now houses uh, a different school, which I'm glad to say that, that my daughter continues that legacy by um, uh, now participating in City High School. Um, we're so proud that we participated with the marketing campaign at Grand Rapids Public Schools. Uh, and you'll find that uh, if you go to wegr.com. Uh, where we talk about um, uh, the, the potential that our public schools uh, have uh, and what the, the good things that they're doing um, for our children. Uh, we want to I want to thank you for um, being able to support um, uh, teaching about Cesar Chavez uh, in our schools. Uh, although we have not yet seen it uh, fulfilled to the extent that we'd like, we have faith that this will happen. We have uh, made presentations at our local. A public school um, board meeting and, and but I thank you because you were instrumental in making that possible so we can have that um, amongst my, my children we can either church or, or school or other community organizations including our upcoming uh, annual um, social justice march commemorating the Cesar Chavez they have logged hundreds of hours and that comes from a spirit of community leaders like like Lupe that encourage uh, civil engagement um, and with that, uh, I'd like to talk to you about what I'm doing at the Hispanic Chamber uh, to move the needle along. Besides my, my day job being as a banker uh, with Fifth Third Bank, um, I am also involved in my community. I'm a treasurer of the uh, uh, Western Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And we recently launched um, a, uh, an economic development uh, committee, and we titled it uh, um, Education and Empowerment. And our goal is to advocate and promote and facilitate uh, to Hispanic businesses in our community. Um, and this is not done in silos. Uh, we've actually um, are participating with six different organizations, the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan, Spring GR, <coughs> Emerge, Grow, which is Grand Rapids Opportunities <coughs> for Women, uh, and GR Current, and of course, the Western Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And the, the model uh, is to, um, be able to provide training on branding and, and marketing, social media, uh, communication, and advertising to Latino entrepreneurs and uh, Latino-owned businesses as well. Um, the the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan has provided a training space, so we again we appreciate the collaboration with them. I mean, we thought it was important that you uh, would know this as well as uh, what we're looking for is to be able to expand the horizons for our Latino business owners, be able to prepare them, and eventually be able to uh, a place where we can evolve into a full-fledged workforce development program. This will only happen uh, with collaboration, 
um, stakeholders, organizations, and of course our uh, individuals like yourself that, that, that move the needle in regards to education. Um, we need our, our, our schools to play an important role in supporting programs like these. Um, we need resources, of course. Um, we're starting this program and we'd love an opportunity next year to be able to provide you uh, with some metrics and some information and, and, and what we'll be able to accomplish. So with that, I'd like to have my children they also have some prepared um, comments as well. Sorry, Annie. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Cuevas, and I attend um, City High Middle School, and I'm from Grand Rapids Schools. And um, I'm in the Inter International Baccalaureate Program, and I have been at the school for three years. And I've learned in those three years, in those three years that it's really challenging, and. Um, could say that it kind of implies that the um, there you, there's a requirement for like excellent time management skills, and um, I believe that the school's um, requirement to meet cer <coughs> certain civic engagement hours prepared me for a life long passion to be involved in my community, and so um, I like to thank you for what you do for our schools, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank, thank yeah. you. <coughs> Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emily Cruz, and currently I am a student at Innovation Central High School with GRPS. Um, I belong to the Academy of Health and Science, and my goal is to study medicine and become an obstetrician slash gynecologist. Um, I transferred from Houston, Texas for my junior year here, and I honestly feel like my school has challenged me to, like, to achieve my full potential. Um, I've been on the Dean's List and on Honor Road the, the entire year, and so I'm very you know, grateful for that. I want to thank everybody for supporting like the many programs that I um, participate in. Uh, later this week, I will be participating in the Cesar Chavez Social Justice March. So. And I am very grateful and very thankful that we have had a chance to learn about Cesar Chavez and what he has contributed, like contributed to us. So for that, I am very grateful and thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Omar Kravis Jr. I am a student at Innovation Central. I am a junior, and I um, I am part of the Academy of Modern Engineering. And I um, I want one of my goals is to be become a um, Medical or oh, a modern engineering, uh, well, biomedical engineer, and um, I think someone here, uh, I forgot, I don't know his name, but he told me that it was a very big demand in that field, mm -hmm. and uh, so that kind of just, uh, I guess, motivated me more, I guess, and uh, at, at that school, and I, and many other schools, I, I also attended Creston. Um, it, it it has opened my eyes up to uh, the different fields um, of health, of uh, medical and medical fields, and um, and I've been attending well, academy of modern engineering, and uh, it has opened I guess opened my eyes to <laughs> all those different careers, and uh, I also want to uh, thank you for um, uh, letting. Uh, give it the chance or opportunity to to teach more students about um, the life and uh, and uh, what Caesar Caesar Chavez has uh, has done in his life and uh, I've, they uh, they they teach it in Spanish class and a lot of students actually do like hearing about him and have been motivated more by hearing his story so um, I am gonna have a I have an opportunity to participate in the uh, in the Cesar Chavez uh, <coughs> march, and I have a piece um, to read, and uh, I think uh, give my gratitude uh, to everyone here to to, the, to give us the opportunity to to learn about that. Hello, board of education members. My name is Adrian Cuevas, and I am a eighth grader at C. F. Foster and Environmental Academy. Next year, I'll be attending Innovation Central. 
I want to thank you for allow, allowing us to learn about Cesar Chavez in our schools. We need to learn about Latino role models that we have, so we that so we have people to look up to. I, I, I participated in the Latino Youth Conference last week and got to meet the people who inspired the movie Spare Parts. I learned that it is your effort and opportunity opportunity that determines success. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Ashley Cruz and I am a student at Central, well, Innovation Central High School. And as a freshman, I have gone through all four programs which are business, business, design construction, engineering, and health and science. And I have chosen, chosen to stay in health and science to pursue a career as being a nurse. <coughs> And I wanted to thank you for all that you have done for us to give us the opportunity to go through that and to be in your school schools. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello, board members. My name is Samantha Cruz. I'm a seventh grader at CA Frost, and I wanted to thank you all for, for, for allowing us an opportunity to learn about Cesar Chavez. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> si se puede. Mm -hmm. Si puede. Thank you very much. And our final speaker is Corey Michael Mays on an unrelated topic to what we've previously been discussing um, most recently, but music education. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for making time for me today. I know it's slightly out of your regular agenda, and I appreciate you being flexible. My name is Corey Michael Mays. I'm the executive director of the Michigan Music Education Association. I'm here today celebrating Music Education Advocacy Day. It's the first year we've had this event. We've been spending our day going around to legislative meetings. We had a fantastic uh, concert in the Capitol Rotunda uh, this noon with three performing ensembles from around Michigan. And there's some folders coming around that kind of talk about the day we've had. Uh, as I said, I'm with the Michigan Music Education Association, an organization that represents over 700 music educators in Michigan mostly from elementary general music settings and pre-service, i.e. bachelor's and master's programs in music education, teacher training and certification. We're sharing this day in partnership with the Michigan School Vocal Music Association and the Michigan School Band and Orchestra Association. Together, our three associations represent almost 3,000 music educators in the state of Michigan. Now, by my records, Michigan has somewhere between 4,000 and 4,500 music educators, so we interact with most of them. Um, we're here today advocating for music education. Certainly everybody understands the value of music education in schools, but not everybody is fully aware of what music education is like right now. Michigan is a great place to be. It's got great schools, great educational programs, and we have a strong history of performing ensembles and music ensembles in the state of Michigan. But we have a long way to go. There's lots of gaps in Michigan. And you'll notice in your folder that we're asking for three specific leg legislative asks to all of our legislators today. First, a mandate for elementary music instruction. There are 45 states that currently have some sort of a fine arts requirement in the elementary setting. Of those, 33 states have contact time requirement for elementary buildings. Michigan has nothing. No requirement for any fine arts credit in an elementary building. No contact time requirement for elementary students. We do have that great high school fine arts credit. That's all we have. We're very much below the curve compared to other states. And that's very scary. Elementary music instruction is great for a lot of reasons. Besides the fact that it really helps students get ready for those secondary programs, it's the right thing to do. I don't want to send my children who are four and two into an elementary building that doesn't have quality music education. I, I don't want them to be a part of that setting. Um, and that's very scary to me. I don't want to be around in five or 10 or 15 years and see what happens if our kids don't have sequential music instruction pre-K through 12. So we're asking legislators to follow the MAEIA guidelines, that Michigan Arts Education Instruction and Assessment Guideline of 45 minutes a week, 45 minutes, sorry, twice a week. And we're hoping that we can get some good traction on that. The second thing we're looking for is improved teacher evaluation practice for music educators. Certainly, everybody needs to be evaluated. Everybody wants to be evaluated. Music educators especially want an evaluation tool that fits them. They don't want to be evaluated on a one-size-fits-all model. Marzano is out there. Danielson is out there. Those are, great men those are great models, and lots of districts are using them or using another hybrid of those. But it, it doesn't fit a music educator. It's blinking at me. Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't fit a music educator. Music educators right now are often, uh, often evaluated on reading scores, math scores. Those are great scores, and those are very important to school districts. I can't argue with that. But music that, that's not... 
that's not acceptable for a music educator. Music educators need to, need to be evaluated on what's happening in their classroom, what's happening with their performing ensembles, their concerts, their regular curriculum. Number two, we really ask that music educators be evaluated by people that know something about music. Too often, administrators are overworked, very busy, and they're coming into a, a, a classroom and they might say, oh, I'm here for five minutes, let me watch. And they'll, they'll type some comments, and the comments might come back as, looks like the students were having fun. They, <laughs> what a neat activity. Approved, great, great evaluation, see you next year. Well, that's great for the teacher, they've got their evaluation, they know that they're gonna have a job in that super. But it does nothing for them growth-wise. Music educators want a quality evaluation so they can get better. And they want their students to be part of that process so that they can receive better instruction down the road. The third thing that we're asking for is to make sure that the loophole is closed that allows anyone with a K-5 or a K-8 all-subject certificate to teach music. Right now, that loophole exists where if a school district chooses to cut a music educator, they can have anyone with a K-5 or a K-8 all-subject teach that music class. That's very scary. Anyone who teaches music needs to be JX or JQ certified. They need to have that four years, five years of a bachelor's degree and, and or a master's degree on top of that. Uh, you know, there are lots of teachers who are teaching music classes that maybe had one undergrad, one three credit undergraduate class. That's not enough. That's, it's very scary that, that those folks are teaching music education. And we're really looking for these things not because we want more teachers in schools and not because we want to solidify music education from a teacher standpoint. We, we're looking for these because it's what's best for kids. As I said, I don't want to be in Michigan in five or 10 or 15 years if, and see this as the status of music education. I want my kids to have better, and not just my kids, every kid. I am fortunate to live in a great district and, and have these programs offered, but many students are not. There are lots of students that live in areas where these things are not part of their regular offering. We want to make sure that everybody gets the same instruction so that all students are receiving the best music education they can. We're here to talk to you. We're here to reach out to you if you have questions or are curious about this more. We're hoping that the legislators continue to talk to us and engage with us and maybe make some motion on this. And I really thank you for your time today. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And are you folks music educators? And could you introduce yourself? We'd love to know sure. who you're. Um, I'm Karen Salvador. Um, I used to teach music in Eaton Rapids, Michigan. So I taught kindergarten through fourth grade music and choir. And I'm now a professor at the University of Michigan on their Flint campus where I do music teacher education prep, educator prep. Great. I'm Kelly. Oh, I'm sorry. And I'm the president-elect of the Michigan Music Education Association. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm Kelly Graham, and I'm the president of the Michigan Music Education Association. Um, and I teach first and second grade music. Ryan Shaw, PhD candidate in music education at Michigan State University and former band teacher in the state. Thank you. Ruthie Ann Knapp, I taught over 40 years of music in Saginaw City Schools, retired, ran for school board, and now I'm the school board treasurer. Uh, and we don't have a program because that was one of the cuts. Um, I am also a past president of the Michigan Music Education Association twice. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I was out of order a moment ago. John, report on state superintendent search. Um, no, it's not yet. I have it. It's after when we go back to regular. Yep, you're on, John. This is still the morning. All right, so we're back in the very important. I do, we do have a very public process, as it should be, that has uh, given us three very strong candidates, which we're going to talk again with tomorrow. Uh, and I do want to talk in a minute about what we can expect tomorrow and how we're going to run tomorrow. But I also just wanted to note and describe exactly uh, why and what happened with the executive order that made this process much more challenging than it needed to be and why I'm so disappointed in that action. Um, it was more than a month ago I went to see the governor's staff done with them as much more basically saying it's important that we try hard and work together and particularly looking at picking the next superintendent that we should use that as an opportunity to try to come together and uh, come together on other educational issues but we must find a way to uh, identify a reform-minded superintendent that can work well with us in response to our agenda but also has the virtues of working well with the governor's office the legislature and the field uh, and so that's why i strongly encourage Bruce Dennis uh, and then John Walsh who he uh, turned me over to and then said please get your education advisor to our table and make sure they're they're participating actively the governor as John has noted is a 
ex officio member of this board and has strong stake and influence over this case and very important that their voice be heard and their perspective on what would uh, be important in terms of our topics as well as the qualities of the next superintendent. And that's what happened. You saw Karen did uh, fast track her role <coughs> and to participate in our discussions. Uh, and that's why as we had six great semifinalists that we had vetted together with the governor's staff input. Uh, we brought them forward and why, again, last Tuesday I was so dismayed when in the middle of our beginning of our interview process, uh, get a call and a message from John Walsh saying the governor has decided to uh, execute this executive order. Uh, I immediately uh, communicated uh, saying this is counterproductive to how we need to improve education. It will uh, be a problem as we are in the middle of our search process. It will result in the kind of um, issues that we've been talking about in this morning in terms of uh, a demoralizing and debilitating effect on our ability to work together and pull together state board, department, next superintendent, governor's office. As, and they reported they were talking more about it. Uh, I was hopeful in the next 24 hours that there was some reconsideration. And as you recall, we were advancing together and identifying those we wanted to advance to the finals. Uh, and if I recall our first preference vote, which I do very clearly, we had a bipartisan uh, board uh, and the governor's uh, representative uh, seeking to advance Alan Ingram, Brian Whiston, and Scott Menzel. That was when we got the word, I got the word directly that the governor had decided to go ahead with this executive order. Uh, that I communicated uh, to my colleagues and it had already begun to be leaked or was in the air. But it was when that message came through, because I told all of you, let's be patient, maybe they will not do this. Um, when it was clear they said they would, that's when understandably some of my colleagues said uh, changed their voting preferences in the first round. Uh, understandably saying this collaboration needs to be a two-way street. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, we ended up with three very strong candidates, um, Vicki, Scott, and Brian. Uh, Alan Ingram was not one of those finalists, might have been, but that's a direct responsibility of the governor's um, actions, which provoked an understandable um, dynamic in our discussions and our search process and the opposite of what we were headed to. Uh, so we do have three good finalists. Uh, and tomorrow we're going to uh, learn more about them. We have been learning a lot about them all uh, from various voices, uh, third party perspectives. And I think we're going to ask them all uh, a lot of tough questions about uh, their background experience and uh, the way they would uh, play this role. So uh, with that, what we're going to do tomorrow, and we're going to reach a decision tomorrow, uh, we will be uh, preparing questions. I've asked for input, gotten a lot from many of you, just uh, with questions that you'd like to ask. We're going to have a, a list of questions that are candidates for questions that people may want to ask based on your input. Uh, that will be uh, made available just to us as we begin the process. But also, you all will be encouraged to ask any question you want. You can choose from the list. You can ask a different question. I think we will ask, uh, we will have the ability to follow up and talk with each of them. And in each of, in this, our goal is to identify the person who can best help us and work with all to improve education performance and outcomes in Michigan. And we'll, uh, we'll work together to make a great decision on who's best equipped to do that. And I want to thank everybody who applied. I want to thank our six semifinalists. I want to thank the three folks who are finalists, who all are very strong candidates, for being uh, willing to be in this public domain and to have their uh, life and experience uh, uh, investigated very publicly uh, and to uh, willing to go through that for the opportunity to really help us improve education in Michigan and to be, as Mike knows, of someone uh, who is uh, in the work of public service uh, with all the attendant um, satisfaction, glory, uh, frustrations, and, uh, and sometimes criticism that that entails. Uh, and that's uh, important. I want to thank our finalists uh, for their willingness to, to do that. So look forward to tomorrow. And uh, when do we get started? 9.30 again? And we have a, we have a schedule and we'll, we'll be spending hours or whatever it takes. I don't think it'll take forever for us to deliberate, but we'll do some thoughtful deliberations after our interviews. So thank you.
Thank Great. you, John. Great, John. Thank you. And each of these candidates I know personally, they can handle the criticisms <laughs> and, and that great glory, too. They can handle all that that comes with it. You really do have a good slate, so good, good job. Well, we're going to go back to the afternoon now. I think that's enough to do that. Sorry if I'm out of sequence somehow, but I think that's when we get right to we did the public participation, now introduction of new MDE employees. And I understand we only have one today, and that's from Natasha is going to introduce Lisa. Yep, so um, we want to give Lisa Siegel an opportunity to introduce herself. She's in the Education Services Division in the Office of Career Technical uh, Education. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Lisa Siegel, and I worked at the Shiawassee RESD for 15 years in the Career and Technical Education Department, also coordinating the Workforce Investment Act, which is an employment training program for at-risk youth. And my current role here with the Department of Career and Technical Education is as their professional development specialist. So I'm planning and coordinating all the professional development for our customers in the field. Also doing some CTE marketing and then also some monitoring of the Perkins grants um, that our customers um, utilize in the field. So thank you for <coughs> having me today. I appreciate it. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. She works with our excellent director, Patty Kent, who, as you know, she's a real <laughs> treasure for the department. So we're happy to have them both here today. Thank you. Uh, approval of State Board of Ed minute minutes at 115. Hmm. Um, approve, let's see. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of February 10th. So moved. Supported. Eileen, supported by Lupe. Any discussion? Changes? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. And carries. President's report, John. Uh, I have nothing more to report. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I'm going to keep mine short. Now, some of you asked for the full version of this, but said, would I show a little clip that apparently Marty picked out? So we'll see what this is from. Uh, I do appreciate those that were able to come to the GUP Summit. I know that was a tough day, to say the least. I don't know how you pulled it off. Um, I, I, I tried to carry our, what I think is our collective vision. Uh, to, to that point. And while they're doing that, um, I would just say, I mean, I know you acknowledge this. You had another great candidate and Randy at, from Marshall. Boy, I did a visit there. If you get a chance to see what they've pulled off uh, with the combination of, uh, you know, Albion that was struggling and was probably not going to exist and, and merging with Marshall High School. And I would say this. To be blunt, you know, I was disappointed when I first walked in because adults seem to be sitting, <coughs> I found out later, based on their residence. Kids, not at all. The kids were all mixed up in different, in, in different tables. And uh, the first gentleman, I, I said, so how's this been for you? And he said, oh, just horrible. And I, my heart sunk. And he said, but that was only the beginning. Now it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'm from Albion, and I was worried. But it's just been exceptional. So I thought I'd report that out. There was highlight really of my month kind of I'm going to cut out the other stuff then other than maybe this one just a minute or so yep I'm a mime basically <laughs> <laughs> poverty that's part of what we have to focus on. So here's the piece I want to just get on the table once and for all. I've kind of done this, but I've always been afraid it's going to look like an excuse. And we just have to face it forthright. Poverty. This is a point I'm, we have 1.8 million kids. We don't compare well to places like Massachusetts. We have a lot more poverty than that. And this is a hard nut to crack. And the reason it's appropriate, I think, for this audience is it's beyond the classroom. I mean, think about this. You know, with the reforms in place, teacher comes to the classroom. And a few blocks away from here, I bet there's a hungry kid who went to school today. Um, I bet there's a kid that might have a home life that is, is different than what some of us would expect. I'll just say, I was a Brooklyn, New York kid. And I, I was never hungry. Uh, my dad was a GI Bill guy. Um, he worked a job, went to school at night, um, wasn't ever hungry. But I'll admit, I was not feeling safe going back and forth to school. 
And this happens particularly in rural and urban poverty. This can be a problem. And then the teacher is supposed to provide a miracle and say, hey, let's do math. I mean, the kid's thinking, like, I'm, I'm scared to death. Am I going to get home tonight? So there's a point here where these are intersecting things that have to do with more than just the classroom. And they're more, they're more, uh, more of that happens where we have poverty. So what I'm saying is if there's hunger, if there's safety issues, if there are all these other things, please don't think it's just the educator's job to turn this around. This is our collective job together. If we're not... Piece, obviously, That's each the best of these. Speech, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I had been reluctant, as I admitted in the speech, to not make it sound like a state superintendent. That's an excuse for non-performance, but to not understand it has an impact. And what I, I I redid that the night before, as some of you know from what we were originally, partly because as I was walking around and doing the reception, I mean it didn't really hit me. This was the first time it was combined with the business community. And uh, I get mocked for saying no malice, but there was no, there was, I don't think there's malice on their part, but they, I heard a lot of people come up to me afterwards and, and it was for us so obvious, for some of them it was like, that's a good point, I hadn't really thought about. So, I mean, you know, it's obvious to us, there's parts in their world that are obvious to them that would not be to us. So I don't want to judge that. I just thought if that got some folks thinking about, you know, be careful how we criticize our teachers, be careful about how we hold people accountable to things that are very tough to be held accountable. And it, and it seems to have had an impact on that group. Our group kind of knows that, and, and I think that. Also, I would just say I thought Melody did an outstanding job in that herself, and I would like to turn it over to her with that. Show us your video, mm -hmm. please. Yes. Oh, I don't have any video. Awesome. <laughs> I have one video. <laughs> So March is reading month, and it's the busiest month of my year so far, um, in a great way. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Shortly after the last state board meeting, I was asked to uh, speak to the House Education Committee, uh, and that was a great experience. Definitely something new for me, but it was a chance to uh, just kind of share uh, what was on teachers' minds. And my message in that was promoting teacher leadership and uh, amplifying teacher voice. And then I also got to speak to uh, struggles and challenges with class size and the cuts that have been made at schools that impact our students. Uh, that same day, uh, since I was in the area, I went to visit uh, a classroom in uh, East Lansing schools. By, uh, with the teacher by the name of Mary Weaver. And she has a classroom design that is um, without student desks and uh, you know very uh, forward thinking. And that's been something on my mind this year. So this was great to see. And you can just see the classroom environment is open and there's lots of choice for students um, and a lot of opportunities for kids to move around and collaborate. So that's what I'll be moving towards next year. I got to speak at the MEA conference as well, uh, which was at Kobo, and with a very large audience, probably the largest so far that I've spoken to. Um, but it was a great experience and a great crowd, uh, and I actually even ran into uh, a former colleague of mine where we used to work together at Michigan State University as technical interns in education. That was when the requirements for technology had just come about for teacher certification, and we got to um, kind of check those off for teachers. So that was fun to see uh, a former colleague as well. I went to Phoenix, Arizona over a midwinter break and, and um, got to meet all of the state teachers of the year from each state and territory. Uh, and these were just outstanding, uh, phenomenal, inspiring people. Um, and uh, we had connected through a Facebook group that I had started months before. So. Uh, we really felt like we knew each other already and then spending a week together solidified that and now um, we are all in constant communication and look forward to uh, our trip to DC in April. Um, there were different types of training while we were there, media training, uh, policy training, um, and then we got to visit the Wrigley Mansion where we had a dinner sponsored by University of Phoenix 
And uh, that was a great experience. And we were given a surprise that evening where uh, each state teacher of the year would receive a Teaching It Forward scholarship to gift to somebody else in need. And it is a full four-year scholarship, um, which is estimated to, to be worth around $40,000. So I'm currently in the process of um, having community members nominate um, people that they feel could benefit from that, and then we will select and um, apply by April 15th. So we were thrilled and very, very moved by that and very grateful to University of Phoenix um, to be able to pay it forward to somebody else. Um, I did attend the Governor's Economic and Education Summit where I got to meet one-on-one -on -one with our governor and that was a great experience as well. And then I got to uh, attend a dinner where Mayor Mike Duggan uh, was our speaker and then also to speak to the audience uh, which made me most nervous of all the things this year just because um, I feel comfortable speaking to teachers, uh, very comfortable with students, but this was a different audience for me. But uh, I still can't believe the response to it. So I really just spoke about what I thought you know, all teachers feel and what I know all teachers feel. And again, just like Mike said, I think that it's pretty obvious, but um, it's not to everybody. So the response was tremendous. The next day there was a... <laughs> I kind of just thought I'd speak there and then it would be the end of it. Um, but the next day there was some headline that said I blasted standardized testing, which I didn't. <laughs> I don't um, necessarily, necessarily blast anything, um, typically. But it was a headline that got people's attention and, and the meat of the article was very true to my message and it got people to read it. So uh, uh, several people reached Welcome. out to me. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Looking for right. the blast. Um, Ten years behind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I had several, several people reach out to me and ask me to publish the speech um, just so that they could share it with colleagues or um, share it in a more public way. So I did turn it into my next blog, which I titled Ignite the Flame, which was really the message uh, in that everybody is great at something and the best leaders will tap into everyone's leadership potential and therefore ignite their flame um, and, and kind of keep them going as leaders and wanting to do more. Um, so that's been an amazing response that I did not expect, but I'm grateful to have <coughs> that voice for teachers. Um, I spent the day with uh, Jackson ISD teachers uh, this month and we were doing professional development around reading strategies, uh, specifically aligned to um, you know, the new Michigan standards and metacognitive strategies for kids uh, in all grade levels. So that was a great and a great audience uh, as well, um, great discussion and dialogue, and I enjoyed my time with those teachers. I was invited to Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital for a coming together event of the Chaldean and Jewish communities and I was one of their speakers, and we were also celebrating Reading Month, and then they did some cooking demonstrations, which was really exciting, in a beautiful facility, uh, and they had different members of the community talking about um, holiday foods from each culture. So that was a lot of fun, and I learned a great deal, even about my own culture that evening. Um, since March is Reading Month, I've had many requests for author visits, and that has been so much fun and so exciting to visit different schools, speak with kids at different grade levels. Um, I've even spent a day at a middle school, uh, which was interesting uh, because while the book is uh, targeted for elementary level, the message is definitely uh, on target for middle schoolers, and that was a great experience as well. So I've worked with kids and audiences from, you know, 100 to, in this picture, 650 kids at once um, and they had lots of energy and they were great. I visited uh, Edison Elementary in Fraser, Pleasant Lake Elementary in Wald Lake, McCullough Elementary in Dearborn, St. Clair Middle School in St. Clair, Millside Elementary in Algonac, Grandview Elementary in Clarenceville, and Botsford Elementary in Clarenceville and I have about 10 more scheduled in the next month. Uh, through the author visits and the work I've been doing uh, on bully prevention. I, I have now partnered with Defeat the Label, who I recently met with, um, with their president and several staff members who have done a lot of work with middle schools and elementary schools and would like to now implement curriculum into elementary school, which I will be um, helping to develop. So I'm excited for that new partnership. 
and Diary of a Real Bully has gone on tour. So several of the state teachers of the year have uh, shared it with their schools and districts in many different states. And then one of them, who is the state teacher of the year for DODEA, the Department of Defense, uh, she lives in Germany and she has shared it, so it's gone internationally as well. And then she set up a virtual author visit with a classroom of, of third graders in Italy. So, um, so I've gotten to share that book with kids all around the world so far. Okay. Um, last week I got to uh, attend one of the days of the uh, state superintendent uh, interviews. And I don't have a slide of that, but I found the entire process fascinating. Um, and it was great to be a quiet observer and um, just hear the outstanding candidates and their interviews and also uh, the great discussion and dialogue uh, afterwards. And, you know, I thought about a lot of it, and, and from a teacher perspective and an educator perspective, we feel that politics often um, kind of get in the way of doing what's best for kids. So I, I'm just hoping that with the state superintendent search that the candidates will be looked at for their merit and for their experience um, and, and, you know, what they can bring that's best for kids. Uh, and maybe with the politics aside, um, <laughs> I feel it's that um, there are great choices and we hope that the bottom line will be what's best for kids and, and what could make a difference for educators. So thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, approval of nominations to the SEAC, to the Special Education Advisory Committee. Um, each year, as you know, the State Board is asked to approve nominations to SEAC. It advises the State Board on matters concerning the education of children with disabilities. Um, today, the approval is requested for eight organizational nominations, four at large, and six alternate nominations. And I think Terry's going to give us a little preview here, along with Natasha. Good afternoon. Afternoon. The um, State Advisory Committee is actually required in federal law under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, and they are supposed to be acting in the capacity of advisors to this State Board of Education uh, pertaining to impacts or um, unmet needs related to children with disabilities in light of the decisions that are made at the State Board level. Every year we have nominations because the term is about a three-year term. We have um, 30 voting members, 22 organizations are represented, um, and eight members at large. Um, there is a defined member requirement, which just simply means that 51% of our committee must be parents of children with a disability, or they themselves must have a disability. Um, and so even with our organizations, the first priority is that even though they are acting as a representative to an organization, I think those are listed in a packet that you were received. Um, the first priority is to find a parent of a child with a disability um, as a first consideration. So with the nominations that we have um, given to you, six of the eight for our organizations meet the defined member requirement. Um, none of our alternates this year do, um, but all of the four at-large members that we're looking to nominate um, meet that requirement. So in um, approving the nominations that we have given you, we would meet our 51% um, of that <laughs> defined membership. <laughs> so, any board comments, questions? Do you? Yes, ma'am. Is there a listing of who they are? It's in them. I'm trying to. I might. You're lucky. Oh. <laughs> well, let's. We do have paper. We, we, we cover. I have paper. Nothing like a good book. Paper in the iPad. Nothing like a good book. We've been having problems. Oh, yeah. Okay, bind us up. Coming in late. I have yes, passed out. Are, are we going to do the report on grants or H? Or we going to skip that? Or? Um, apologize. I think that's part of the superintendent's report, meaning it's usually yeah, there I'll for right. our information. Yeah, I have and if we okay. Want to I think she okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, then. Right. But well, we can go back. Yeah. Yeah. Apologize. We can Shall go back. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Did you want us to just go over the list of nominations, or do you all have the packet in front of you? Or? Yeah, just want to see the finals were. But he doesn't want to open. Oh, oh, I thought you don't have a Oh, in an email. I just thought you'd put the name. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's a page. There's a printer. It's like your applications. Okay. There's the organizations. Okay. So I'm trying to think. 
Okay, so Katie, ma'am, who I, because I know I gave a few, num a few, but I know s s some couldn't. You want to know what thank you notes to expect? <laughs> yeah, no one. <laughs> I don't know if so the at large <coughs> item C. It's Heather Bird, Danielle. Mm -hmm. I forwarded. Show her which one was hers. It was just one of the ones I forwarded. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then these others were nominated by other people. Right. Right. From the department. Right. Okay. 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 So the one, um, there was one that came in late, right? Um, we the, received, I think you gave us four. Yeah. Um, the first three didn't meet the requirements of the defined member, but Amy Sanderson did. Yeah. And right. so by the time we received your fifth one, we had already filled all of our slots. Okay. So right. the last one we received from you actually does meet the criteria. So we're keeping that kind of in hold in case we have members who change positions or no longer are affiliated with an organization or for whatever reason have to leave their seat and we would we would but use her as our first but she would have to be renominated next year we'd have to come back again. to the board mm -hmm. okay. okay all right thank you sure any further comments i did nominate one person i didn't know if they were from saginaw i don't know if they um, met the criteria or not um once we receive a nomination, we have to vet the person to see how they if they help us meet our 51 percent. Right. Okay. And so on the sheets in your packet are the forms that we fill out, and it does indicate in there whether or not a board member nominated the person. Um, but I think this time, um, the one we had from Michelle was the only one that actually met the uh, criteria. Can we just make sure that you receive Pam's? So can we? For a I'll moment, just sure. is, is it in there the one that you? I can check. I can. Uh, no, but let's let's make sure your yours didn't get lost in the shop. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to suggest that perhaps we can follow up to make sure the person met or didn't meet the criteria and pass that information along. In an okay, I just didn't know if it affected the vote. Oh. I mean, we're nominating. I, I you're approving the, the nominations now, right? right? Mm -hmm. So we, but it, it doesn't appear to be in this particular packet um, the nominee that Pam is talking about. No, I think I think I'll look and see. The only nomination, the only nominees that we have indicated from a board member were the okay. from Michelle, oh, which I think it may be that the person nominated didn't meet the criteria as being a parent of a child with a disability or was a dis an individual with a disability. And in order for us to meet our 51 percent criteria, we have to keep looking to make sure that that, that uh, threshold is met. Are you comfortable, Pam? Or do yes. You think yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just, to, just for clarification, so all of the ones that are at large, um, they don't necessarily have to be um, uh, have a disability or a child with a disability, but the group as a whole has to have 51 percent disability or child. But a lot of people from organizations may or may not. All of the at large members have to be defined members. Okay. Within organizations, they're part of the defined membership, which is how we meet our 51%. So some of them have to be have to meet that. Others don't because the chances that we're going to find all the people yeah, are pretty yeah, slim. So some yeah. of our organizations have representatives that don't meet the defined member, but we have to use that as our first consideration so that we're never falling below that 51% representation. So some people might be great people, but if taking them that we wouldn't meet our 51 percent we can't take them we have to keep looking for someone who would is there are times when you may be able to take someone yes because okay. 49 percent don't have to meet that okay. yeah. you know what the percentage roughly is now that it's don't 51 percent oh it is it's just right <laughs> yeah. on the dot yeah. so almost half don't right, yeah. right. okay well good work All thank right. you <laughs> any further comments is there a motion then they have a motion Motion to approve the appointments to move. Moved by Kathleen, yeah. supported by Michelle. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you very much. I had a question. Yes, ma'am. 
Terry's still here, maybe she could send it to me. On the Saginaw Intermediate School District, where the, you approved the uh, changes, it just says everything was updated. Yeah. And I don't know what was updated to. I'd like to know what the... Uh, On a plan? Those are the, that's what it was updated to. And this is... I know it says, I know what it says. But it's it not, you're saying... information. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's pretty terse. Uh, it, it means a lot to you. It means little to a, a board member. I, I personally it haven't even seen it, so I would have to go back okay. and review that. But I'd be glad to do that and give you some additional information. Thanks. Yeah, if you could give us some more information, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Okay. And Richard, let's go back to your uh, point, sir. Uh, just there, are three, four, and five were all uh, identified uh, in the same way, and. Uh, uh, one seemed to this be. Is, this is in SEAC now. Sorry, guys. You're okay. Yeah, We're going back to. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> well, you had them looking puzzled there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> They're scrambling four or five. So, this is what item, sir? So we can be clear who's. Item H on report on grant awards. Okay. H on grant awards. Uh, three, four, and five seem to be the same grant, uh, but they seem to be grouped. One, one seemed to be ISDs and. I couldn't quite tell the difference between the other, the other one. I was just wondering: is is that the same? Linda's kind of okay. Is that the, the same uh, grant program that was uh, divvied into three reports, or what? Okay. There, there are some other pieces as well, but these are three of the pieces that are going out. Um, and the first one goes out to those who are the consortia leads. So, if you recall from the presentation okay. we've given to you guys, there, are, sorry, to the board members. Uh, there are five consortia leading this work, and they so this money, the one, 1.3 million, provides supports to the leads to then funnel down to the, the other, their membership to keep their work going. I have to confess, I've sent the 14 million out to ask the staff because the backup sheet's not here. And I, I hope I'll have that in just a minute. Okay. And then the 22 million is for all of the activities that are going on. So remember, there are about 12 activities that go on from. Uh, purchase, device purchasing to, um, or not device purchasing, but from data hubs to uh, teacher preparation to, um, things out, to the SEN, a variety of those pieces. And so this is the money that goes out to support those activities. So the staff has been through, reviewed all the applications that we had out for, um, had out, uh, and they provided their responses during the grant process. Okay. And so that's what that's for. Thank you. I, I just wanted to understand a little bit about what was behind that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I, I was curious about that too. Okay. But I also want, um, <clears throat> in seeing who they went to, yeah. there was nothing for either Detroit or Wayne County in any of those that I saw, and I wondered why that was. Was yeah, that given under some other yeah. program, or why weren't they included? So, for the two that I've already addressed. All three of them. There was nothing for Detroit and Wayne County and any of them, I don't think. If I read it right, <coughs> it's a whole long list of districts, pages. <coughs> right, all of this is, and Detroit is a part of that. So they are getting money for. Uh, I don't think it was listed in there. Hmm? It was not listed there that I could do. Unless something skipped, it went from. C to Dryden. <laughs> I don't, there was nothing C between the Dryden. C's and the Dryden. You're right, it goes from countryside to Dryden. We'll check that for you. Oh, okay. Oh, that. Because I believe Detroit is participating in this. In this we'll, we'll verify that and okay. we'll have it before Mar after Marty's finished. Remember, we do that and we'll come back with giving I you a. The details on this, this yeah. one page. Oh, Detroit yeah. is participating. But let's do it here so we can answer it for others that might have the same. Question. So when Marty's done, we probably would have an answer. I, I probably will. Well, then why don't we go to Marty, and then we'll come back to uh, someone watching us probably from the fourth floor here. So, okay, you're good. So I should take my time, Linda, is what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to take a while. I'm trying to be quick. You need to, Marty. I don't know. Um, on March 9th, there was a, the State Board's Legislative Committee meeting. We um, discussed several items. Um, and from that meeting, we developed a letter to David Behan, the director of DTMB, to um, offer the state board's um, expertise in developing the request for proposal for a statutory adequacy study for education funding. 
Um, there has been no uh, funding um, appropriated yet, but in the event that that happens, uh, the State Board wanted to make sure that they would at least offer to be part of writing the RFP uh, to for the contract, for the third-party contractor who will do that adequacy study. And that letter went to Director B in last week. So we have not heard, I'm not sure if John has heard back, we have not heard back yet uh, from Director Bean. Um, we've also... So <laughs> send back our department. <laughs> well, I, said, I look forward to your response and letting me know how and when the State Board can help DTMB in the development of this. I think I signed so, that before they right. got to the department. I would have put that P.S. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, if a department shows up over there, send it back. <laughs> right. It's been this place. <laughs> um, also, um, the discussion was for the April uh, State Board meeting to invite the, legislator, the legislators um, for lunch. Those would be the appropriation subcommittee members as well as the standing committee members. So we are in the process of doing that for the April um, State Board meeting. Um, what should we serve? What do they like to eat? Gross. <laughs> <laughs> no, kidding. <laughs> well, we haven't really discussed the menu, but uh, we're open for suggestions. Seriously, we are open to suggestions, and Mertz would be open to any of those you might have. Right. We're all going to jam in the uh, <laughs> uncle room. Right. Uh, no. Legislatively, um, we were asked this morning, the, the, the so-called um, SWAT team uh, legislation um, is going through the process again. This is the, this is the legislation that died in lame duck. It didn't, um, didn't get passed to develop a, an early warning system for deficit districts or to prevent deficit districts. The legislation has been reintroduced, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. And uh, the first meeting is tomorrow. It is in the House Financial Liability Reform <coughs> Standing Committee. Um, so that's be, that'll be the first hearing for those bills. And interestingly enough, uh, the governor announced uh, today that the state treasurer, who this a lot of this work will be done with, the state treasurer Kevin Clinton has stepped down. We're going back to public, to private <coughs> business. And uh, Nick Corey will be the new state treasurer. Really? Nick, yeah, Nick used to be with the Senate Fiscal Agency, used to be a deputy treasurer. Deputy. Now he's with DTE, um, a real quality guy. So he's going to be the new state treasurer. Oh. I think beginning, I think uh, Director Cl or Treasurer Clinton is here until April 17th, I think I read this morning. Hmm. So anyway, that, that legislation is in the works, and I know that Kyle and his team are working closely uh, with the legislature and the Department of Treasury on... On, on those uh, bills. Another set of bills that has um, surfaced uh, since our legislative committee meeting was a set of bills to create a, a, a state endorsed STEM diploma. And we don't know, have a lot of details about it, but there, are, there, there was a meeting today in the Senate. There are two, there's a Senate package and a House package. I believe they are the same bills. Um, there was a hearing today in the Senate Education Committee and a hearing on Thursday in the House Education Committee. And what it basically would do is would set up a um, requirements to receive a STEM diploma endorsement. And it would include all the, um, a, a pupil who successfully completes the following requirements while in grades 7 through 12, they'd be eligible for a STEM endorsement. All the applicable requirements of the Michigan Mayor Curriculum at least six credits in math approved by MDE, and at least six credits of science approved by MDE. Now the school districts would have to submit to the department in a form and manner prescribed by the department a certification that the pupil is eligible for the STEM diploma. So they would have to verify that a student did complete the required courses. Um, so we are working, we will be working with the legislature to see how this all works out. Because we would, I would think we would need resources to kind of validate all these students who would be eligible for a STEM endorsed diploma by uh, endorsed by the state that they have a STEM endorsement on their on their high school diploma so we'll be getting you more information when that you know when, when that goes through the process so um, and then there also on the there was a approval of the 2013-14 annual legislative report uh, for school improvement plans, which was discussed in Linda, thank you, and Linda discussed it at the legislative committee. I'm not sure if, if what the board's pleasure is. If you, if you want to get a brief presentation, the legislative committee 
did get a presentation, discussed it, and moved it to this point. So the board would have to approve that plan to be sent to the legislature as required by law. So the committee's recommending approval, and where would how would the board like to proceed with that? Who was from the legislative committee that was part of that discussion? What do you recommend, Eileen? Mean? Yes, okay. I was on the phone, but yes. Sandra Lupe, you were on the phone, right? Do we need to hear about it, or do you want us to approve it, or do you? I don't think there was anything in it that, <coughs> Lupe, do you think the board needs to hear a better discussion uh, than just approving? I don't remember any points of major contention. Which one are you talking about? There. That's right, you were on the phone too. Yeah. It's, yeah you know, over. sometimes if people don't speak up, I start losing track of who's there. Uh, what do you think? It's the, it's the, um, the uh, annual SIP, report. The school improvement plan. School, yes, the SIP, the school improvement plan oh. that, that oh, yeah. was we, sent by, we discussed by that. on the internet. Yeah. That's a separate do you remember, item. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember any conflicts? No conflict. We had no, no, dis well, everybody was happy let's with approve it. Let's approve it immediately. Quickly. <laughs> 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 we somebody it. does. May I have a motion, no, please? No, no I so moved. We support. <laughs> it was moved by Lupe. It was supported by Eileen. A any discussion? We went to sleep in there. What's that, Ken? No, I'm, I, I have supported it. Oh, okay. I, I did mm -hmm. it. I supported it. Just, I, just I to know it at the, board, at the committee meeting. Yeah. We just to know what you were talking about. That's all, because I was mumbling. <laughs> you were. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So <coughs> this has been recommended to the whole board, the whole board, yes. by this by the committee, and there's been a motion and a second. Yes. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. Thank you. The motion pro, uh, passes, and we'll send that to our friends across the street. Correct. Right, can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. I, I know it's the stuff that was proposed in that um, that the house bills on the <clears throat> early warning. And so maybe there hasn't, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it because it's pr been pretty recent. But mm -hmm. So um, my understanding is it also would increase the amount of loan, uh, like for uh, deficit districts, from like 50 million to 100 million. But I didn't know if it would apply to emergency managers, people with, that have a consent agreement or emergency manager. And I know that's a really technical, specific question, but <laughs> it, was, it wasn't clear to me. Um, then you don't have to answer it. It's, now. it's, it's in the description of the bill. It says uh, from 50 million to 100 million as to school districts. So I believe we should apply even if you don't yes. have an EM. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll defer. Kyle, Kyle says yes. So okay. thanks. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, it will be interesting to have the lunch next month. You know, kidding aside, that should be a good way to build some relationships. I think there's stereotypes both ways and. I find most of these folks are really decent trying to do the right thing from their perspective. And if they can hear our view on things, sometimes over a sandwich, that can really help. So it's going to be everybody, it's going to be from the House and Senate? Which committee? Sorry. <laughs> what? It's the, everyone the, from the lunch House committee. And yes. Both and, the, and both parties. Both, absolutely. The members of the appropriations <laughs> subcommittees on education and K 12, as well as, as well as the standing education committees in both the House and Senate. Okay, thank you, Marty. Yep. And how about do we have Our information? Um, we're still working on getting the amount, the, the, the one page that's missing. Mm -hmm. oh, we'll try and have it for you yet before you leave. And then this is so that schools that are participating can per do device purchasing of whatever they want. And so as long as they fill out a report that's on the front end, we call them M-Tracks, and then they participate in um, testing. Uh, then they qualify for money based on their student population, and this is what the 14 million is about. And I've, I'll have you the number from Detroit. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Mm -hmm. Consent agenda. I think we had. So may I have a motion, please? So supported by Kathleen. Supported by John. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same. Great. Thank you. Comments by state board members. Tuckered out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had I had two yes, two educators from Saginaw, obviously, and one of them was my elementary um, educator who was here with the band group. So it was very inspiring oh. to see them here. So. Oh. Cool. I'll just uh, yes, throw sir. this out because of uh, my Shakespeare pen. I went to uh, Kensington Woods uh, School where their senior 
class does a Shakespeare play every year in Pinckney, and uh, so much ado about nothing. Oh, mm. So uh, it's great to see uh, uh, our students uh, challenge something uh, like a Shakespeare play, and uh, especially not to see Romeo and Juliet again. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I've seen some great productions at high schools. It just well, get a good night's sleep. Tomorrow's an important day for all of us, and especially you, but thanks for your service, and we'll uh, see you tomorrow. Okay.